celebrate with me all God's doing? I think the most exciting part to me, uh, and listen, uh, five campuses, uh, I think we had close to 2,400 people, and like that's great, don't get me wrong, numbers are awesome. But the most exciting part of that to me is that we're a part of a church that I feel like are, are, is making true on God's word that the gates of hell shall not prevail. prevail. In other words, we're going to go against the gates of hell and we're going to knock them down over and over and over again. I'm really excited about that. I love the fact that Anderson had 340 college kids and Wayne said there was one gift in the basket. So uh, they're off to a good start. Uh, the college kids' attendance uh, is high, giving is low, but I, we're, we're going to get there, all right? With that said, listen, we've got a real problem this morning, okay? If you've got a Bible, open up with me to 1 Samuel 17. I've got to cover 54 verses, okay? Those of you who know anything about the way I preach know it's hard for me to cover five verses, much less 54. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to talk real fast, you're going to listen real fast, and we're going to get out of here on time, okay? All right, I'm going to talk real fast, you're going to listen real fast, call them listening ears, okay? Go ahead and put them on. I'm going to pray, and we're going to dive right in. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that you are king of the universe, that you are on your throne. Uh, Lord, I've been really encouraged this week, even as I've had various conversations with different friends who are, who are struggling with the way the world is. Dear God, the one thing I am confident again, uh, about is that the church will stand, God, and the church will go forward. And dear Lord, nothing else, nothing else truly matters compared to that, Lord. Uh, so we're glad to be here today. We're glad to be in your presence, and we pray that you would work in us now to the glory of your name and advance me your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if, you know any, if you're a true American, you can finish this sentence for me. Remember, kid, heroes are remembered, but legends never die. Remember, kid, heroes are remembered, but legends never die. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? The Sandlot. The Sandlot, okay. Millennials know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody older than that is like, what are you talking about? In the, in the Sandlot, there was this great, uh, great one-liner from the babe himself. Babe Ruth told the kid, as he was going to bed one night, remember, kid, heroes are remembered, but legends never die. And that's true to a certain extent, because as things be, uh, there are certain things in life that are, are so massive, such, such of consequential importance, that if they take on a legendary status, uh, they, they almost take on a life of their own. And that's what the story that we come to this morning, David and Goliath, has achieved the, the legendary status. David, um, when we start to talk about David, we're talking about somebody of a legendary status because of all that God used him to accomplish, primarily killing Goliath. Now, there's a real problem as we come to uh, this story, though, even though it's a legendary story. Why th this story is so legendary is because it's really familiar to us all. Now, hear me say this. I don't think I'm about to preach these 54 verses of David and Goliath, and anybody in this room is going to be like, Man, this is so, so good. I've never heard this before, right? Most of, if you, even people who don't have church context have heard of David and Goliath. The problem with that, though, is as we become familiar with things, we, we think we know what's going on in the story instead of what's actually happening, right? And so we'll begin to read like David and Goliath, and what we'll assume is like, man, th the meaning of this is clear. Like, God wants me to be David, right? And I'm supposed to be awesome, and I'm supposed to slay the giants in my life, and yeah, that's what this is all about. Here's the problem with that. You're not awesome, and you're not David, okay? Uh, if there's anything any of our track record shows, it's that we, can, we routinely are not like David going down into the valley, but we're more like the Israelites hiding up on the side, scared to get into the fight. And so what we're going to see is that this is actually, um, it's two things, an encouragement a challenge to live a life of courage, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, but maybe even more than that, it is a gospel illustration. It is painting a picture for us of what Jesus Christ has actually done for us through David. So with all that in mind, let me set up the context of 1 Samuel this way. Ancient warfare is not something that is glamorous. Now, uh, modern warfare, even people who have been in the military can attest, it's not too glamorous either, but one of the benefits of living in a modern age is that modern warfare generally happens at a distance. We have these things called rifles, and they fire projectiles called bullets, right? And everybody's like in South Carolina. We know this, Pastor, right? Uh, I got seven of them in my truck right now. Amen, all right? But we got these things called rifles, right? And they fire projectiles. And here's the good thing about that for warfare. Generally, when killing's done, it's done at a distance, Okay? Some of you are like, well, I didn't know we were coming to the art of war. Welcome, all right? Now, ancient warfare is completely different. Ancient warfare was done within the breath of the enemy. 
So you can, like, as you're going, like you're fighting, you know, Joe, and you, you can tell that Joe had peanut butter for breakfast, right? Because this is done, like, close quarters. And you had a shield, and you rammed with the shield, and you blocked with the shield, and you had a sword, and you cut. And this is how war was done. And it was done so close together, so close combat, that when all was said and done, you would go back to your camp, and you would wash, off, uh, you would wash yourself off to find out if the blood was on you was of your, uh, your blood or your enemy's blood. And that's the context, and we're introduced into 1 Samuel chapter 17 when battle's about to break out. Look at what the Bible says. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Sokoa, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokoa and Ezekiah and Ephes Demim. And Saul, the men of Israel, were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, the Israelites stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Real quick, let's clarify what's going on. First of all, when we read the Philistines, you should know that the Philistines are the arch enemy of the people of Israel. Some of you are old enough to live through the Cold War, all right? Don't raise your hand because, like, what you're thinking is the Cold War was 1980. That's 20 years ago. It's 2020. That was actually 40 years ago, okay? It means you're getting a little older, all right? But that's neither here nor there. So you lived through the Cold War. You know, and, and if you lived through the Cold War, you know that there was this age of tension between the Soviet Union and America, right? We were constantly battling for our interest. That's what the people of Israel would have, uh, how the people of Israel would have considered the Philistines. They were literally the arch enemies of the people of Israel. They were always competing for the land for, the, for their own interest. And so these people now, uh, the Philistines and the Israelites, have drawn up for battle one against another, one on the right side of the mountain, one on the left side with a valley in between, and this is really geographically important because for the battle to proceed now, the one of them would have to give up the high ground and go into the battle to fight, okay? And so what's happened is they've reached the moment of no return because the fight's here. They've just got to decide who's going to go. Uh, if you've ever, men, maybe you're here and you've been in a fight, right? And like you didn't know like if you were actually going to fight, but there becomes that point like of no return, right? The guy says something about your mom and you're like, we're scrapping now, right? That's, what, that's where they're at. It's the moment of put up or shut up. They're staring at each other around, uh, uh, from uh, across the valley. Now, in the midst of this moment, walk something that terrifies the Israelites. Look at verse 4. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Now, real quick, what is a champion? A champion is someone in the ancient world who, as a, in a form of representative warfare, had fought and defeated other enemies. So what, what is a champion? A champion is a cold-blooded killer. And into this champion, into this valley, walks a champion named Goliath, and it tells us a little bit about him. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and weight, the coat, the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Real quick, let's talk about what the Bible's telling us about Goliath. It says that he is six cubits in a span. Now, that is nine foot, nine inches tall. Six cubits in a span is nine foot, nine inches tall. Now, just to clarify, men, let, let's, all, like, let's put our masculinity on the table here for a second, okay? <laughs> if in this room, you come up to me and you challenge my manhood and you challenge my family and you defame my God and you're like, let's fight, okay? If you are between the heights of 5'5 five, five and 6'2", I'm good, right? I'm like, you know, this guy's six one. He might can take me, but five five six two, like maybe we'll maybe we'll throw hands. All right, if you're six three or above, I'm like, you know what? You're probably right. I'm not that great of a guy. My family's not awesome, <laughs> right? At nine nine, do you know what you can do to me if you're nine nine? The answer is anything you want. Okay, <laughs> and that's the situation they walk into. Now, real quick, just for your intellectual knowledge there are some people who wonder if this is a scribal error that instead of six cubits in a span it should say four cubits in a span in the original language which would be six foot nine instead of nine foot nine and to my question is does that really matter <laughs> all right and probably not but let me just uh, explain this to you a little bit more because you we live in a world where somebody might challenge this a little bit on you uh if they're challenging the veracity of the bible but this is a really big deal no matter how tall uh, goliath is because the, 
historically, we know from archaeology that the ethnic Hebrew people were not very tall to start with. Maybe 5'5 five, five on average. Now think about this, 5'5 five, five on average, and David is what? The smallest of the Hebrew people. We know this because they said he's small, right? So 5'2 versus 6'9 or 5'2 versus 9'9, nine, nine, let me just tell you how that fight's going to go, all right? Not well. And so this is the situation that we kind of we walk in. Verse 8. This is what Goliath did. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, or are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be, able to, we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and you shall and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel. This is really important. When he says, I defy the ranks of Israel, he is challenging them and he is shaming them. He's basically, this is, this is the, the equivalent, ancient Near East equivalent of saying, you punks, come and fight. All right? Come, I, I defy the ranks of Israel as they give me a man that we may fight together. Now, real quick, verse 11 may be the most important verse. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, a couple things that I want us to see just right off the bat. The first thing we've got to notice about this story, if it is a gospel illustration, is we've got to take note of we got to take note of Goliath in the text, okay? First thing I want us to see is this. The enemy in this story is relentless. The enemy in this story is relentless. I want you to notice a couple things about Goliath. First of all, Goliath is relentless in his presence. This giant, this threat, comes day after day after day before the people of Israel, and he challenges them to fight a battle that is impossible to fight. Now, this is a gospel illustration, so like, kind of lay it all flat here. What does that mean? He's challenging them to do something that in their own power they cannot do, right? Doesn't matter how much Philippians 4.13 eye black they put on up under their eye, they're not going down and slaying this giant, right? Like all things are possible through Christ, not a 9-9 giant, right? So he, he, he's, he's relentless. And notice what verse 16 says. It says that for 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So morning time they would line up for battle and the Philistines would think, well, maybe this is the day we're going to go fight. And out, and out comes Goliath. Now, and once the guy did this, you couldn't just attack them all because you had to see if a representative was going to come forward. So morning time would come out and here comes Goliath. You guys are a bunch of punks. Come fight me. And he would go back in and nobody would come out. Nighttime would come out and Goliath would say, hey, I'm still here. You guys are still a bunch of punks. Let's fight, right? And he would go back in. Now imagine this for 40 days. He, what we see here is he's relentless in his presence and he's relentless in his threats. He's challenging them to come and fight a battle that they can't win. Now what we need to understand is, we talked about this last week, is the challenge before the people of Israel is for representative warfare. Okay, And now we talked a little bit about this last week because in the ancient Near East, typically, if you had representative warfare, the king would go and fight the battle. Right, And so at this, point, at this moment, he's challenging them to representative warfare where he'll fight and give me another man. Now, who should the other man be? Should be Saul. Right? We talked about this. The Bible says that Saul was the man tallest in all of Israel. He was a clear head and shoulders. And just logically, if we're talking about who's going to go fight the tallest guy they've got, we're probably going to go send the tallest guy we've got. And so the, the enemy's relentless in his presence and his threats. Now, how does this apply to us? Okay, we see how it applies to Israel. How does it apply to us? I want us to see this. The enemy in our lives, just like the enemy to Israel, is relentless and unconquerable. Just how the people in Israel face the giants, we have giants all our own that we must face in life. Now, as I thought about this, I kinda, we kind of have to put into perspective because we're not going to go fight a 9-9 nine, nine giant, right? Ancient warfare is on the table. But as Christians, if this is a gospel illustration, what are the giants in our life? And here's how I define the giants in our life. Giants in our lives are the things that we are afraid to go into the valley to fight. The things that we look at in our lives, that all things being equal, we're scared because we don't know how to deal with these situations, right? And I'm not talking about scared like hiding in your, hiding in your bed uh, covered. I'm talking about there's hesitancy in your soul because you don't know if you're strong enough to overcome the obstacles in front of you. That's what giants are. So just a couple of examples. Uh, a, a giant 
is the diagnosis that you didn't want to hear, and now you're not sure if you're strong enough to even fight the battle. A giant is the financial trouble that you find yourself at the end of each month when of no fault of your own, the money that needs to go out is not the money that's coming in. All God's people said amen, right? The giant is the marital issues in your marriage that have been there for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you swore at 5, 10, 15, 20 years that that one day we're going to get past this, we're not going to have this problem. And now you're on the other side looking down into the valley of those marital issues, and you don't know if you got what it takes to overcome them. The giants in our life are rebellious children who we've been praying for and praying for and praying for, but ultimately we don't know if they'll ever come back. And now we're on the side of the mountain looking down into the valley, and we're afraid because we don't know if we've got what it takes to overcome the giants. And listen, ultimately what we're going to see is that sin and death are the giants that we would never be able to conquer in our lives anyway. The, the, the ultimate giants in our life is that we were born into a world with hearts determined that we were going to be God and God was not going to be God. And because of that, there's a giant that, we, that even though we try real hard to stop sinning, we try to do what God tells us, we try to be better people, that we can't overcome that giant of sin in our heart. And then truthfully, that we'll never overcome death because last time I checked, death was undefeated. So these are giants in our life. And so what happens is is we go through life, we're just like the people of Israel on the sidelines, scared to walk down to the valley because here's what we know. We can't can't win the battle. Israel, for Israel and for us, the enemy's relentless. And I want you to see this. I want you to see this progression. The enemy's relentless, but of course, fear is natural. I love verse 11 where it says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Um, yeah, right? Like nobody reads those words and they're like, Oh, you were scared of the 9-9 nine, nine giant? I don't understand, right? Like this is the most natural response that Israel and, all, that, and that Saul could have gave. No one can judge the, Israel or the army or Saul here. In the face of a 9-9 nine, nine giant, you would, you would be afraid. And it's the same is true for us. In the face of the things we face in life, fear is a natural response. Now, I'm going to define fear real quick, okay? Because here's the deal. When I say words like fear, uh, and, and uh, I'm picking on men so bad today, right? But when I, when I say words like fear, uh, men automatically say, well, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm big, tough. I'm not afraid of anything. Here's what fear is, okay? Fear is hesitancy to step into the space God's called you to. It's not like crying, right? What is it? What do, what, do we, what do we see it? We see fear as God telling us to walk in a certain space, but we're too hesitant because we want to be in charge or we're scared of the consequences or we love ourselves too much to walk into that space. Fear is hesitancy to walk into those spaces. So no one, can, no one can judge Israel, no one can judge Saul, no one can judge us when we walk in this hesitancy. But here's what's really important for us to see. Just because fear is a natural response for us does not mean that it's not a sin. Now, that's, that, that deserves a little bit of definition because a lot of times we think of things like fear as emotion. We don't equate that with being a sin, okay? And it's not always a sin, but there are times in our life when fear prevents us from stepping to those spaces and it turns into something called cowardice and cowardice in life is actually a sin so what what we see the people of israel and what we see saul here is they're walking in fear and that fear prevents them from walking into the valley and it's actually turned into cowardice and hear me say this cowardice in life is a sin let me prove this to you okay revelation chapter 21 when i'm saying cowardice saying it's embracing that fear to be hesitant and not step into the things God's told you to walk in. Revelation 21, look what the Bible says, verse 8. When John is talking about who will be separated from God for an eternity in hell, here's what Scripture says. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, is sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, I want you to see something here. John, in describing who will be separated from God at the last day, has said that in levels of disobedience, there is no de- level of disobedience that separates fear and cowardice that's preventing us from following God from sexual immorality and murder. 
He says, he says, if you're walking in fear such that God has called you to go down into the valley, but you refuse to walk into the valley, then you are being disobedient at the same level as someone who's cheating on their spouse. That's tough. So just because fear is natural doesn't mean it's not a sin. Just because we walk through life hesitant and scared to actually get in the game and follow Jesus doesn't mean we're not sinning in that. Now, as we look at the people of Israel, what we see is the main example of cowardice present is Saul himself. He was meant to fight Goliath. He was the tallest person in Israel. He was the king. Yet where do we find him? We find him hiding in his tent. So let's apply this to ourselves. Cowardice in our life where our lack of faith in God's power and God's promise leads us to despair and become hesitant in following him is a sin. Because now get this, Saul knew the power of God, did he not? Saul has seen the power of God work in his life over and over and over again to defeat armies that he didn't have any business defeating. He knew that God could do whatever he wanted, when, however he wanted, wherever he wanted, Right? And he also knew the promise of God. What was the promise of God to the people of Israel? That you will drive the Philistines from the, from the promised land. So Saul has the, present, the, the power of God on his side, and he has the promise of God on his side, but instead of doing what God has called him to do, he walks in cowardice and instead refuses to step down into the valley. Now, this is, this is important because we need to see that when we don't walk in faith in God's power and faith in God's promise, we're actually be being, we're actually becoming the same person Saul was, refusing to walk in what God's called us to walk to, whether that's obedience to him, whether that's confessing sin, whether that's sharing the gospel. When we don't trust his power and his, and his promise, we're just like Saul. And two things begin to become obvious from the story. First, if Israel is going to prevail, they need a better representative because Saul's hiding in the tent. They need somebody who's going to conquer the giants that evidently none of them can. And secondly, if they're going to prevail, someone is going to have to take courage to trust God and put one foot in front of the other and act. Enter King David. Now, this is probably... One of the most entertaining passages of Scripture we're about, to, we're about to read in all the Bible. Look what it says in verse 12. Now David was the son of, Ephra, uh, of an Ephraite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. Skip down to verse 17. And Jesse said to David, his son... Oh, I'm sorry, this is really important. Okay, look back with me at verse 14. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. Listen to this. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep. Where did we find David the first time? Feeding the sheep. Where did we find David the second time? Feeding the sheep. Verse 17, Take for your brothers, Jesse says to David, Take for your brothers an ephah of parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Now, I love this because Jesse's like, Man, my sons are so brave. They're out there following Saul. I need to take them some extra food, right? They're probably hungry after the fight they've been fighting for the past 40 days. Because remember, he doesn't know that Goliath's out there. So he says, David, go and take some food to your brothers. Here's what he doesn't know. That for the past 40 days, his brothers haven't been fighting. They've been cowards. Right? David's all proud, uh, Jesse's all proud, and his brothers are sitting on the sidelines like cowards. Now Saul and all the men of Israel, verse 19, were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went. Now, real quick, let me paraphrase, paraphrase what's about to happen for the sake of time. When David gets there, he left early in the morning. When he gets to the battle, the battle lines are just starting to be formed. In other words, they're taking their formations for the day, and everybody's thinking, well, maybe Goliath won't come out today. Maybe the day's the day we're actually going to fight, right? And so when David gets there, David drops off the, the rations and goes to the front line. And as he begins to talk to his brother, Goliath comes out, and David hears Goliath's rebuke and, and Goliath's challenge and Goliath's shaming of the armies of God and Goliath's blaspheming of the armies of God. And I love David's response to his brothers. David looks at his brothers who have been there for 40 days, punking out, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Man, what a shot. Who is this punk? Who is this guy who, who dares defy the armies of the Lord? And so David's like, let's go kill this guy, right? And they're all like, well, God, man, he's been doing this for 40 days. 
And like, can you imagine the shock that David feels? Y'all been listening to this for 40 days? I've been here for four minutes. Like, let's fight. And so now, now you got to understand, the, the mood in the camp at this time is despair. Everybody doesn't want to go fight. Everybody's scared to death. And so here's what begins to happen. David's like, I'll go fight. And this rumor starts cooling throughout the camp. And he goes up to one of the guys, and he's like, hey, what will the king give me if I go fight? And the king said, man, he's made, the, the guy says, man, the king's made known what he'll do. He'll give the man who slays this giant riches. He'll give him all the money he could ever want. Well, David's like, that sounds good. What else? He's like, well, he'll also give his daughter to, marry, to uh, marry the guy who kills his giant. And David's like, well, I'm about to be royalty. This is awesome, right? And he's like, what else will he do? He said, the king will also make his father, whoever slays this giant, he will make his father's house free of all, uh, in all Israel. Here's what that means. No more taxes for the rest of, the, of your life in all the father's house. And David's like, I hate the IRS. Let's go, right? And so he's like, I'll fight, I'll fight him. And so this, this starts to break out until it, the rumor gets back to Saul, verse 31. And the Bible says this, When the words that David spoke were heard, they, repeat, they were repeated them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Now here's why that's funny. Because Saul, he's talking to the man who should have went and fought. He's like, hey, Saul, I know you're scared. God bless your heart. Man, it must stink to stink like you stink, right? <laughs> I'll go and fight. And Saul's response is normal. He says, you are not able to fight with this Philistine, to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, listen to this, this is the best line in all scripture, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. When, David? Oh, like 12 hours ago. Like, this is the classic example of, of propping yourself up in a job interview, right? Right? Like, I, I used to keep sheep for my dad. Really? When? Like, this morning, right? David's like, I used to keep sheep for my father. He's propping himself up, but look what he says. When there came a lion or bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. David is open hand slapping lions and bears. <laughs> right? They, now, I got, that, kid, that gives me a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions. The first question is, where exactly is the beard on a bear? Okay? He grabbed him by his beard, and then he slapped him. Second of all, that dude would have been a heck of a boxer, right? I mean, he's, he's punching lions and bears. And he says, here's what he says. He says, the same God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. It's like, I ain't scared of it. God, I'm, I'm on God's side. I'm not scared of this guy. And so Saul sends him. Now here's what really, becomes really important. In David, we see a willing representative. When no one else was willing to go in and fight the giants that they couldn't beat, David comes and he says, I will go down into the valley and I will fight the battle. Here's why this is a gospel illustration. Because there was a time when we couldn't defeat the enemies and the giants of sin, death, and hell. And Jesus Christ looked at us and he looked at us in our shame and he looked at us in our fear and he says, I know that you cannot defeat sin. I know that you cannot stop sinning. I know that you cannot defeat death. I know that you cannot defeat hell, but I can. And he left. He left heaven and he went down into the valley and he conquered the giants that we cannot. So in David, what do we see? In David, we see a willing representative. This is a gospel illustration. This story isn't about David. This story is about Jesus. And listen, even if you're here today and you're a believer, we need to preach this to ourselves over and over and over again. What is the gospel? The gospel is that there is a battle that you cannot win and you would have never been able to win. And on your own, you are headed towards sin, death, and hell and eternity separated from God. And Jesus fought the giants that you couldn't. This is the best news in all the world. It's not about David. This is about Jesus. Praise God. We preach this to ourselves over and over and over again. Every day when we wake up, we think, we're thankful that we have a God who went into the valley and fought the giant for us. So we see a willing representative. Somebody started to clap over there, and I think you should have. That was awesome. We see a willing representative, and we also see a person with courage that comes from God. Now, here's why this is really important. David shows us that faith in God's power and in God's promise leads to courage. Faith leads to courage. Listen to me. 
Faith, being a person of faith, leads to being a person of courage. That you walk into the world and you are not afraid of what the world presents you with because you are confident that the God who conquers giants is on your side. So he walks into the valley of courage. Now, let's apply this to us really quick. Faith leads to courage. Now, what is courage? Courage, by my definition, when, is when we pull ourselves together and trust God, then put one foot in front of the other, even if we're afraid. Here's what courage is. It's when everyone else is falling apart, everyone else is in despair, you somehow know and remember who God is and that He's on your side, side and you pull yourself together, and then you begin to live. One foot in front of the other. Even if it means you're going down into a valley. That's what David did. And, and so I really gave some thought to like what does courage look like in real life? Like what does courage look like in this church? And I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, I came up with a lot of examples of what courage looks like in this church. Of pulling ourselves together, knowing that God's on our side and going down into the valley. Let me give you a couple of examples. I think courage looks like Brian Owens. That even in the midst of unimaginable tragedy, unexplainable tragedy. When I talk to him, Brian says, I know that God's got us and that God's going to take care of us. So what does he do? He lives. He puts one foot in front of the other and he goes back to work. And he takes care of his kids. Can I just tell you, that's courage. Man, that's, let me tell you what else. I, I got a couple of examples. Courage Courage is Stephanie Tao. Courage is when you lose your husband to COVID. And I, I, I love her to death. And, I, I, and every week when Miss Stephanie comes in here, listen to me, guys. Every week when Miss Stephanie comes in here, she's going to hug my neck and, and hit me so hard after this service. She's, she's either crying when she walks in or crying when she walks out because it's been a hard year. But courage is when you pull yourself together and you know God is on your side and week after week she comes back to a place where she's going to remember just how good God is. Courage is the family we have in this church where mom's a stay-at-home mom who used to be a teacher and dad's a doctor with a very lucrative business in front of him and decides that instead of staying here I'm going to leave and I'm going to go to a foreign country and tell other people about Jesus because they need Jesus courage is the person we have in this church that di their diagnosis is terminal lung cancer basically they hadn't been in church since COVID but they watch every week and every, and every, time, I every time I text they say we know that God's got us God's in control Courage is when everything else seems, would tell us to stop, be still, pull back. But in the power of God Almighty, we pull ourselves together and go down into the valley. That's what courage is. Now, here's what's really important. If we have that courage and God's on our side, we're awaiting a victory. Look what, the, look what David says. This is the best sequence of trash talk in the entire world. Listen to this. Verse 41, the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And the Philistine looked at David and saw he, and he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out and meet me with sticks? That's awesome. Am I a dog? Like, this is about to be a great fight. Like, this is like pay-per-view trash talk right here, okay? And here's what he says. He says, the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David, with a better response, said, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head, and I will give you the dead body. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. What is courage? God's on my side. I'm about to kill you. 
That gets me super fast. I thought about sitting down today, right? Man. <laughs> Courage is walking down the valley knowing who's on your side. And here's what we ultimately see. God's power delivers. So I want to close with just a couple series of questions. Number one, what we see in David is a, will, a willing representative that points us toward Jesus Christ. My question for you is, have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ to fight the battles you can't? If not, today's the day to trust in the God who overcomes the giants that you never can. And then church, my, secondly, I just want to ask, if we know that this God is on our side and that he will overcome the giants that we face, what's keeping us from knowing that he's on our side, pulling ourselves together, putting one foot in front of the other, and walking as people of courage who are not scared of anything this world might throw at us? Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would overcome the foolish ramblings of a man right now to glorify your name and to honor your name. God, I pray for the people in this room. God, that we would be people of courage. God, I, I really believe that what we are is not a gathering of random people, but a body of believers, dear God. And dear God, I've just been so encouraged by the real life examples of courage in this room. People who stand up and say, I know that the God of the universe is on my side, so it doesn't matter what I walk through in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Dear God, help us to be these people today. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.